Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our last lecture for the term. Um, thrilled, no doubt. Oh my god, I can hear myself. One sec. Great, okay. I had my own YouTube video playing in the background, and I'm like, now I can hear my own voice. Um, so it's so nice to see everyone. Um, hilarious, I we had 30 people turn up to the lecture yesterday. So I thought, let's talk today about the exam, because um, I thought no one turns up for guest lectures and they're all probably doing the assignment but so far we only have 24 people here tonight so we're going down down the tunnel um that's fine because we've got to talk about things anyway um <clears throat> i don't know if we'll consume the entire evening i'm probably going to have a small little revision lecture um sometime between now and the exam or at least some something along those lines. Uh, today I predominantly just wanted to talk about the exam with everyone and give you all a chance to ask questions um, because, you know, we can write things down on a, you know, a, a web CMS3 page, but inevitably that's going to, you know, that's not going to cover the nuance and the thoughts that are on all of your mind, nor can we document in a concise page um, every kind of different scenario that you know you might be kind of musing over so um the first place to look for us today is pretty much on the exam page um i do hope that um you i guess maybe have tr read this or tried to read it at least i'll just kind of go through the high high level points and please ask clarifications if you need them um otherwise we can talk maybe a little bit more about the exam content, but largely I'll defer some of those questions till we get the sample exam out. So firstly, in terms of sitting the exam, uh, what's really important to discuss is your well-being with respect to the exam. Um, UNSW's policies around exams still basically say that if you decide to start this exam, then you are deeming yourself able and healthy. Um, if you have a kind of condition that you're managing, say you wake up that morning with a headache or you feel really sick or anything else like that, once you start the exam, that's an acknowledgement that you're okay. So if you wake up feeling those things, you can say, I actually don't want to do the exam today. You can go and get special consideration. You can go sit a supplementary exam. Um, the university does not necessarily show a great deal of flexibility when it comes to um, students who sit an exam and then at the end of the exam they're like actually I've been feeling really sick all day I'd like to sit a sup it's kind of like you can either sit the exam or you can not that's it and if you sit the exam um, it doesn't matter how you were feeling before the exam the one exception to this of course is if something bad happens to you during the exam so if during this comp 6771 exam you suddenly feel ill or sick or something terrible happens to you like with your health um, or I guess any other real extenuating circumstances, you know, maybe maybe you have a mother in the kitchen who just drops boiling water on herself and you need to take her to the hospital, like uh, maybe, you know, your dog starts throwing up a lot and you need to take it to the vet, like whatever it is, if something happens during the exam, something bad happens during the exam, then of course we figure out ways to uh, help you sit this up. So if something terrible like that happens during the exam, you simply stop what you're doing um, send me an email as soon as reasonably possible. And then later in that day or the next day, you apply for special consideration with the relevant documentation and they will grant you a SUP. Um, they naturally, with a lot of exam stuff, still check with me. The most common thing that happens is special consideration email me and they say, hey, did this person sit the exam? And I go, uh, yes or no. And they go, hmm. And I've seen people get rejected for SUPs because they did actually start playing around with the exam. Um, Naturally, we can track sessions and other things on GitLab too, so it's really obvious for us to tell. Uh, we've had students try and pretend in the past they didn't sit it. Uh, it doesn't really work and you just end up uh, in a very sad place. So that's kind of what goes on during the exam. The first line of this statement here says that during the exam, you must have access to a stable internet connection for pushing to GitLab and receiving emails. Now, this is really important um, for students that have done courses with me before, whether it's 1531 in the past or 6080 in the past. Um, you know that I, I've said to students before that you need to, if you don't have stable internet, internet connection, go and find stable internet connection. Most of us have at least one friend or family member that has 
better internet than us if we have crappy internet. Alternatively, there's tons of other sources like a hotspot on your phone or a local library or other kind of public Wi-Fi. The problem, the problem at the moment is that we're at stay-at-home orders in Sydney. So the kind of advice about go solve the problem by going somewhere else is not really applicable. Now, the conundrum with this is that it's not really a feasible pathway to simply say, um, oh, we'll give you extra time for your slow connection. Because as you could imagine, there's no real way to quantify that. So if you have a bad internet connection, you're welcome to email me at any time. And what I'd say is the first thing to do is to try and figure out how to get a better connection, if at all possible. You can go move your laptop closer to the router. You can um, move things to a different part of the house. If you're on hotspot, usually like the angle, height, and location of your phone in your house does have better reception. You go take it around to different sides of your house and you'll get better reception. Um, so those things are at play. Um, but if you really get to a scenario where you just don't have good internet for some reason right now, then email me because I'm sure there'll be a few students that we have to basically have sit delayed SUPs, like maybe um, sit the exam in, in a month or two after some of the worst part of uh, COVID in Sydney starts to wind down um, or whenever that time frame is. So there will be a solution here. The most important thing is that if you are hampered by your circumstances, then you try and make those things clear and communicate them as quickly as possible, or as early as possible, I should say. Um, if you have a hard time connecting to VLAB, if it's, if it's your internet, then everything I just said kind of applies. You just have to find ways to get things more stable. However, if the, if the reason is because um, the CSE systems have problems, then that's obviously grounds for extended time and stuff as well. Be aware though, majority of the time there's VLAB problems. It's not to do with CSE and if it is, it's usually widespread. So don't feel like any kind of problem is usually not your fault. Not that it is your fault, but you know what I mean? Any kind, most of the time the problems are on your end, not CSE's end. Um, people are asking about, you know, VLAB, VS Code, SSH working locally. Um, the, the most common way that students are likely to gonna wanna do the final exam is via VS Code, SSH. Um, I believe there are instructions uh, somewhere. I, I don't remember off the top of my head whether we ended up including them in the, or whether they were in a forum post. Um, I'll chase that up after. If anyone beats me to it, you can just post it on the forum and I'll pin it. Um, if it's not already pinned, even though I feel like it's already pinned. Anyway, there's there's instructions for VS Code SSH. Um, I, do, I do most of my work on VLAB, even when I'm under a lot of time pressure. So I, don't, I personally don't think VLAB's terrible, though... I have a mid-tier internet connection, so um, it's totally fine if you have like okay-ish internet. Uh, if you don't, then you might want to explore other options. People have talked about, should I work locally? Um, because naturally, working locally means that you don't have to uh, deal with any internet, with the exception of pushing to GitLab, receiving emails, um, and that's it. Uh, you can work locally. I, I know some people like to do that. The only catch, as Dimitri has pointed out, is that we will do all of the auto marking for the exam on the CSE machines. Um, therefore, it's very important that even if you do work locally, you still actually check things on the CSE machines uh, like before you... like. You need to make sure it works on the CSE machines because working locally for three hours on a problem and then turning around and say and trying to upload it in the last five minutes and then it suddenly doesn't work, that's not grounds for special consideration. That's just going to get you a zero for that particular question. So please be wary that working locally carries that particular consideration. Um, yeah. If you have any issues during the exam, please please email me directly if it's if it's like an exam ending situation. Um, if as in, if you have to like do special consideration or something. Uh, we'll talk about this further down. Generally speaking, we want all posts to be on ed and I'll talk about that later. Um, so, and again, unless you're actually saying I have to stop doing the exam, I'm about to apply for special consideration. We're going to ask that you post on the forum not via email. The forum's easier to manage because we can triage it with tutors and other things if we need it. Um, 
I was talking to my 2521 students earlier today and I told them a story which I'll tell you as well. It's really important that you communicate. I was telling them a story about a student in T1 who legitimately finished an exam like this. They failed to submit it before 5 p.m. when the exam ended. They tried to submit it at 5.01. It didn't, or well, 5.05 or something. Um, it didn't pass. Like, it didn't, it didn't go in because it was after the due date. So, I didn't hear about any of this. And then I got an email from them at midnight, eight hours later, where they said, hey, I just wanted to let you know I couldn't submit my code. Um, so this is eight hours after the exam's finished and everyone's seen it. And my first question to them was, why did you not talk to me about this earlier? Like, hold up a sec, forget about all of the problems. Like, why am I hearing about this at midnight, you know? And their response to me was that the exam was so stressful that they had to go to bed after the exam and they just woke up. And it's like, I tell this story because naturally that sounds like a pretty uncomfortable situation for that person. You know, it's obviously been a stressful day. It's obviously been, well, clearly. Um, but the problem is if you don't communicate effectively, we can't help you. Because in this particular case, we couldn't grant this student any, any marks for the exam because we don't know what they've been doing for eight hours. And as I tell people, I believed that student, but it doesn't matter if I believe people. What matters is like what's, um, what's kind of fair, right? Because um, it'd be really easy to fabricate that you, you know, just work on an exam for 12 hours, fabricate the times and then say you've got to submit. So the point is, please communicate. Um, it's hard to over communicate. It's very easy to under communicate. So please keep that in mind. Uh, Fiasin says, are vaccinations counted for special consideration? Absolutely. If you have a vaccination, then of course you just apply for special consideration. Everything's fine. Um, you go get your vaccine and you set this up. Yeah. I, I think vaccinations are like the one thing that everyone's allowed to do right now, um, regardless of anything. So, um, yeah, cool. I'll get to auto tests in a sec. Uh, just in terms of the exam time, so the exam's on Monday the 23rd of August. That's pretty late in the exam period. It's from 2 to 5 p.m. It's a pretty nice time of day. I like that time of day because people in India and Asia, um, where we do have some students either who've been permanently studying remotely or students who've been locked out of the, the country with the, the relatively aggressive immigration laws at the moment, um, this is still a reasonable time for them. You know, like I'm pretty sure India's like even for India, this is still a reasonable time of day. So um, pretty much all of you will be doing the exam at this time. The only exceptions that I'm probably likely to make, generally speaking, are um, for students in Europe or America. Um, so if, you're, if you are a student actively studying in Europe or America, please email me and I'll try and sort you out. And of course, if you're an ELS student um, who has equitable learning requirements, um, is in... Uh, you know, there's some kind of uh, physical or psychological situation you manage that grants you extra time or something like that. Um, the school already knows about it, uh, which means I, by extension, know about it. And then we adjust your exam times and we confirm those times for you closer to the exam date. Um, so you will get an email from me confirming your exact times. So you'll be working the exam at different times to other students. Um, in terms of exam structure, the exam will consist of two small assignment style questions. Each question will be worth 15 marks, totaling 30 marks. Now, 30 marks, 30% 30 exam. Simple. Um, why this structure? Well, because I made it up. <laughs> so, 2019, we had an exam that was closed book, multiple choice, and lab style questions. That was easy because it was closed book. 2020, we did a longer exam with harder questions um, for a lot of very good reasons that had some surprising consequences that we learned from. And this year, we're opting for a three-hour exam um, with a much shorter base of questions. How small is small? Well, <clears throat> I'll defer you to the sample questions that we will release hopefully on Thursday, maybe Friday, soonish. Your exam is not for three weeks, right? So I'm going to try and get to that this week. It's 
I've, I, I always have a lot of pressing things to do and some days I just have to make decisions between them. So I'm getting trying to get around to that ASAP. Um, so the exam's gonna have two assignment style questions. Now, I, I just wanna give some background on this stuff because I think it's really important that we all understand what and why we're doing. So um, here's, here's the kind of problem that you have in my view in exams. Um, with with exams, if you if you ask like the ideal thing is that you can ask one very big complex question, right? Like the the most the most the kind of uh, the best way you could in theory do something is ask a single question that's like void foo that and you expect you are we ask you to implement this function or this interface um, and it's a really complicated idea. Maybe it's like assignment one is a good example. I don't know why I made that so abstract. Like think about assignment one. We basically give you a function to call and you go and implement it. Um, and we make that the whole exam. Now that's great because it's not too much. Like it's, it's a very focused amount of work. Um, there's a lot of depth to it. Uh, like, as I said, students and us don't like breadth assessments. They're only, they're a necessary evil. So if you can avoid them, it's good. Um, so they're kind of good questions, right? The problem with these kinds of big ominous questions is that if you can't get this question right, if you only get 70% of what you want done, how do we give you any marks for it? And you say, okay, well, we'll manually mark it. It's like, how do you manually mark something that doesn't work? Particularly if it like, how do you even know it's 70%, right? I mean, if any of you here have ever tried to read your friend's code, it's like sometimes stuff just isn't right. Like how, like, how do you attribute marks? You can't meaningfully do it. So one of the problems is that in an exam style sense where everything is auto marked, which it will be, we'll come back to that question because you guys are going to have questions about it. In those scenarios, we have to make sure that um, <clears throat> we don't just ask one question because otherwise if we ask one question, it's like nearly all or nothing in a sense, right? Assignment one was like this, except assignment one, you had two to three weeks to do and you had time to really figure it out. But think about assignment one. If you just got that logic wrong, if you didn't solve a seg fault or some other bugs, then it's like, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't produce the right ladders in most of the scenarios. So what this does is a kind of simple exam produces a distribution of students that basically just looks like, I mean, I can't draw flat lines, but it basically just looks like that um, or, you know, something like that maybe. Uh, and that's not good because that's not what we want. We don't want to see a whole bunch of people down here punished. So the way you get around that is you um, create smaller questions. So you say to yourself, all right, well, let's create, <coughs> let's create like five questions that are all smaller. Or another way of thinking about it is like one question with many parts in it. So you do this kind of thing. Um, and then this is great because you give students a chance where if, you know, if they just don't get this one, if it just confuses them, and then this one they try to do, but like they just don't get it, but then these ones are okay. You, you kind of give people a chance to more adequately reflect, uh, to, to more adequately express meaningfully in the context of how you mark this, um, marks, right? It's, it's good to get marks. The problem is, is that in open book exams where people can share, and we can't stop you sharing, we sure can punish you for it, but we can't stop it. If the questions are too small, then what ends up happening is that if you guys copy each other and we pin you for it, it's a little bit like assignment two, right? So I'll tell you a secret. For assignment two, I didn't run any real, I didn't run any plagiarism checking on your Euclidean vector. And the reason is because it would just give me so many false positives. Like, think about how similar your code is to so many of your friends. And even if you didn't talk, your code has a huge amount of overlap. So these really nice kinds of things, like the antithesis of assignment one, like assignment two, where you have lots of opportunities to get marked separately, the problem is it's ripe for cheating. Um, and for a 30% exam, that's not really something we like. Even for assignment two, it's hard to swallow, but I can swallow it if we do it once. Um, so, therefore, you kind of have to make sure that these questions are a certain minimum size because they need to be big enough that you all can't reasonably produce the same answer, basically. Because uh, if you come up with the same answer, it's like it's statistically impossible that you didn't share in some way. Um, 
So, therefore, those kind that those kinds of two push and pull things got me to a point where, in a three-hour exam, I felt that we could probably do two questions, two questions that take a, you know, a uh, an HD student, an hour and a half each to, you know, pretty confidently get through. Um, it's, you know, ideally we'd ask more, but I think once you start getting into like the time it takes to process a question, uh, work with it, write the code, debug the code, wait for the damn CMake compiler to compile, like you get into the territory if it's just not enough time. Um, this is actually a big reason why 2020 was a 24 hour exam. Like there was a lot of reasons we went that way and it ended up being the wrong decision. Um, but that was funnily enough why we ended up there. Cause we were like two questions sounds like way too little surface area. You know what I mean? Like, cause th this exam does have the fact that, you know, if you really just struggle with one question, it's going to be really hard for you to get some of the marks in the exam. Um, and yes, they're both practical questions. So they're both coding coding questions. No short answer, no multiple choice. Um, it's just too hard given the given the the type of thing we have. Now, I don't want to scare anyone. I'm writing these questions, and I'm going to make sure they're okay, right? I care about you all. Um, but my point is that you know I'm just exp I'm giving background on all of this. So we've got uh, our we've got our two questions, right? Um, and we'll spend, you know, you'll spend some time in the exam on that. There's no, there's no testing in the exam. Okay, a couple of things to answer. I might add these to the spec, um, not to the spec, to the page. Uh, so number one, there's no testing expectations. <laughs> Too late, I'm terrified. You're all going to be fine. Um, there's no testing expectations in the exam. Uh, why are there no testing expectations in the exam? The answer is really simple. If you're bad at testing your code, then I would prefer that that manifests itself in that you won't know how to make sure your code works. I'd say, I, I, for anyone who dropped by my 2521 lecture, I'm sorry that you're hearing a lot of re repetitive stuff today. Um, but it's like, you know, if you don't know how to test, then you don't know how to test. Uh, the example with the 2521 students was they were like, are, they, are we going to get tested on GDB? And I was like, no, because you're probably going to want to use GDB sometimes. And if you don't know it, you'll get punished because your code probably would just be less likely to work. We don't need to assess you on it separately. Now, that being said, I don't want to leave you with the impression that you probably should be writing tests because, frankly, I wouldn't write tests for an exam like this. There's just not enough time to get it right. Um, so there's nothing about uh, tests that you need to worry about for the exam, I don't think. Like, some of you want to write tests, like, good on you, though I don't think it's something you need to get caught up on um, yourself. Uh, you can, though. It's just like I don't I don't feel like you need to put an expectation on you that to be to do well in the exam you need to have catch two tests written. The other question that comes up is around style or C best practices or uh, clang format. And the question as always is are we going to get assessed on those in the exam? And the answer you'll always hear in courses from me is that no, because um, this is a this is a time pressure exam. And every scenario, there are no scenarios I've seen in life where someone asks you to get something done quickly and to get it done beautifully, right? If that person, if you find a person like that, they're probably a bit of an a-hole. So it's like, it's just not, it's just not a thing, right? Like some people, students say, oh, it's crazy that I have to like code under pressure. It's like, you know what? About 10% of my week is working under a lot of time pressure. It's not that unreasonable to expect some kind of like, uh, opportunity to explore that idea. The percentages may be a little more than I'd like, but um, it's okay. But if, if we are going to put you under time pressure, there's no linting, no clang format. There's no, uh, there's no C++ practices. There's no uh, tests. It's just, here's a problem, write something that works. Really simple. Want to keep it simple. We're not trying to burden you with all the stuff in, in the exam time. Um, Uh, Marina says, will we get time to set up our environment prior to commencing? So, yes, because it's kind of an open... I mean, it depends on what you mean by that. So, it's like, you won't get to see the spec prior to commencing, but for anyone who's done my courses before, typically what I do is I release to you um, a, a repo that's like your assignment one or assignment two, which actually has, like, the stub code there, if any, but I don't give you the spec. So, you can actually, like, clone the repo an hour before... Um, 
get the VS code set up, you can actually get comfortable before the exam starts. You just don't have to, uh, you just don't know what you're doing yet, right? Like, it's all just like, yeah, you're just waiting to, to find out more about what you're actually up to. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, some of those answers. Um, Peng says, will we get a structure or template code for the exam? Um, it depends on what the exam questions are. I haven't, I haven't written them yet. Um, I'm kind of focused on the sample exam right now. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, there, there will be, there will be like, if there are some stub code or anything like that, we'll obviously give that to you and communicate that properly. Um, cool. So back to the structure, as I said here, it's going to be two small assignment style questions. Now I just want to stress, the reason I say assignment style here is because um, it's the best, like, I don't know what else to call it. Like they're not shoot style questions. They're the tiny assignment style questions. They're not giant shoot style questions. Um, so, so yeah, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Clarissa's asked spamming git pull when the time ticks to 2 PM. Uh, yeah. So every time I tell CSE, can you please not allow the servers to crash when everyone starts the exam? Um, and lo and behold, it crashes half the time. So that's another reason why I release the tip. Typically what I do is I give you a GitLab repo that you get to access beforehand. Um, and I release the spec at two o'clock and I also email you a copy of the spec. So if, if, the, if GitLab actually goes down, um, nothing stops you working. Uh, so that's the method I follow. Now, basically what I, what I mean by um, some of this stuff is that, uh, Chudo 9. So it's like, what happens is like, we have these chute repos, we have these assignment repos, like assignment one and assignment two. For you, you're going to have a uh, exam repo, which will be here. Well, you'll have one in your folder. Um, and I'll also create you an exam sample repo, or which is like where you can play around with the sample exam if you'd like to, which we're releasing later this week. So when you get the sample exam this week, the entire interaction and structure of your, in like of the exam itself, forget the questions, will be identical to the final exam. So we'll replace it with different questions, but everything else should feel really, really comfortable to you because again, the priority is we want you focused on the questions, not on all the other stuff. So you have adequate time to get, you, you can get comfortable before the exam starts and really set up your environment with the sample repo. Then when on the morning of the exam, we'll release the, uh, the, the actual exam repo where you write your work and you can get set up with that. So, you know, you've got, you've got lots of opportunity there to get comfortable. Now, the questions that follow this are then, hmm, what types of questions are we getting on the exam? You say two assignment style questions, but what in the world does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. Well, it could mean anything, but what it means to me is that, and this may evolve as I write it, just to be clear. Um, not, not that we like, you know, like the sample exam is the answer to this. What is it like? The sample exam will give you a feel for it. Okay. I'm not prescribing this in other courses. They're not like, this is the exact type of question you're going to get. Um, so the exa sample exam will kind of give you that, but I'll tell you what I'm putting in the sample exam just to start. So I'd like two questions. One is assignment one style and one is assignment two ish, three ish style. And what I mean by that is that I want a question like assignment one, where you don't need to feel like you uh, have to know every intricate detail about C++ syntax and smart pointers and operator overloads and all of that. It's just like, think about word ladder. It was just, here's a problem to solve, maybe with a time limit, depending on what the question is, but the time limit would be nowhere near as aggressive as assignment one. Um, and it's like, it's like input output. And the reason I want to do that is because I'm aware that some students in this course find the uh, the, so the problem solving part easy and the C++ part a little bit hard. Um, obviously C++ is everything we do, right? Like any kind of question, even like assignment one, you still need to work with the data structures and, and other kind of stuff. Um, but like assignment one didn't require you to like read manuals of, you know, like assignment two did, so to speak. So I, I want the first question to be assignment one style where you just get to focus on the problem solving you're dealing with and not on all these really nitty gritty language things. Um, this, is an ex this is a question we had from last year. 
um, it was a stack-based calculator in C++. The idea was that you just, you, it, it's like um, you gave it a, a, a command and then um, characters and it did stuff. And the input was like a series of like, add these two numbers, remove these two numbers. You were basically building a stack calculator. Um, it was a pretty easy question. Most people plowed through it and got to the next question in, in like a, in an hour or so. Um, but uh, it, I, I want to look at this again and make sure it's the right size for the sample exam. So, uh, so yeah, this is the kind of thing. It's like, it's not, it's not like you have to implement a class or anything like that. It's just like, um, in C++, we want you to solve a problem. So you're going to have to use C++ to demonstrate to achieve something, but the achievement will not be C++ in the sense of, you know, it's like assignment one. Um, Sam Yang says, if you're familiar with C++, then aren't problem solving harder? Well, I think what I want to be clear here is that I'm not talking about like genius problem solving, like that you're doing, you know, three, one, two, one, or uh, whatever prog chal is. Like I'm talking about really digestible problems that I would feel comfortable giving to a, a, a second year C programmer. Um, just saying, can you just solve this problem? You know, like you're, you're not going to have to be like, oh my lord, how did how does a star search work, or like what's the algorithm again for quick sort or anything like that? That's not the point. Leak. I don't. I don't use leak code. I'm sorry that I'm not like leak code came after the after my insecurities about work. Well, it was. I mean, it was been there for a while, but leak code came into popularity after my insecurities of work died out. So. I've used it. I don't know what the the rankings are. So when you say leak code easy, I'm like, okay, I don't know what what category that really falls into. But um, the point is that these questions are here to test that you can see a problem, produce a solution, something that doesn't require you to know the ins and outs of C plus plus, something that doesn't require you to have memorized complex data structures and algorithms, um. You know, so it's definitely going to be easier than assignment one. Like assignment one is a problem that I would, if like, if it was just in an exam setting, I don't know, three, three, three hours, maybe four. Like if you simplified a couple of things and made it staggered, like the problem with assignment one is it's really hard to half do things. Like, um... If there was a way to segment it, maybe, but assignment one would be a terrible exam question. Like anything we ask you while like this will have to still be broken up a little bit. Like I said before that like these depth questions are kind of like all or nothing. And I mean that in the sense that like we with like the granularity is going to be like 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. Like that's probably how they're going to get have to get split up because you just can't. I mean, beyond the actual testing itself, obviously that'll add some granularity, but... Um, it's not like here's 30 things to do and 30 marks. Go do each one of those things. Um, hard can be a dynamic programming question. That's on the chat. Uh, no, it's not going to be a dynamic programming question. I don't even understand dynamic programming very well. So fat chance. You guys are very lucky that I'm actually not that good at a lot of things. Um, and I'm writing your exam. So, um, which means I'll probably have to write the solution too. So, uh, that's good for you. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, Okay, so that's that's the first kind of question I'd like to put on the exam. Something very digestible. Uh, yeah, it's probably it's going to be like uh, like assignment one, just not as hard, um, because you're going to have ninety minutes to do it basically, in effect. Um, well, the average student will probably spend like an hour and a half to two hours on it because like I would not expect every single student to confidently just bash through every kind of question. Um, but it's like, you know, it'll be, it'll be kind of manageable. Um, Feistin, so expect the first question to take an hour. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how, I don't know how smart you are. I don't know how confident you are. Like, I mean, like on a per student basis, but it's just like the aim that, you know, we would like, we would like, you know, 85% of students to, feel okay about a, a question one and move on to question two within two hours ish that that's like a rough indicator i'm giving you um don't don't dwell on that fact 
they are not laws of physics. That's just me trying to articulate a very, very complicated equation to describe the interaction of 400 people with an exam. So that's a, qu that's a question one style thing. Um, the second question of the exam, I want to make more assignment two and three like. Now, what I mean by that is I'd like it to be something that is class-based with an interface that is a little less problem solving -y and a little more like we need to kind of provide these features or, or functionalities. Um, assignment three is obviously way too like complicated for an exam style question. Assignment two, like, I guess, uh, I guess a way of thinking about it, and I might even have to repackage assignment two for the exam to be for as a sample exam, to be honest, because it might be the easiest way to get something to you is it, imagine assignment two, except there's like half the interface, but the interface is like a little bit harder to manage a little bit harder to like uh, do, um, but not like crazy hard. So like, it's like, you know, we just kind of give you these like 10 little interface points and some expected behavior and then you just go and do it. Um, you know, cause like think about this, like we're, we're, we're not gonna ask you like, okay, let me, let me give you some more context. We're not gonna ask you to have specific implementation details in the final exam because we're not gonna hand mark it. So we can't say, no, 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 you can't use STL containers because I'm not gonna personally read 400 copies of code um, just to like check if you use STL, it's just not feasible, right? Um, the way the way the university works is that you guys do your exam on the 23rd of August and then they, they tell us like, I don't know, uh, results release date UNSW. Usually we need to have results in like six days before um, six days before, like, it's actually released to, to you all. So, key days for release of results. Term two, release of results. Thursday, the 2nd of September. Yeah, so, like, you're going to do your exam here, and I'm going to be told that they need to be in by, like, the Thursday or the Friday, right? That's that's basically what happens in my life. Um, and, ever yeah. So, that's why, that's why it's kind of automarked, generally. Um... Now, I've lost my train of thought to do with results and exam. Yeah, so because we're not going to um, enforce like specific approaches, like we're not going to say you, you have to use this implementation. Um, if you imagine for a sec, imagine assignment two, except imagine if you could use a vector. Now, how ridiculously straightforward would assignment two be if you could use a vector? It would, it would like, it would take a competent student who's blitzing through at 15 minutes because everything's just overloaded, right? You're all just delegating everything. So when I say it's somewhere between assignment two and three, I'm not trying to scare you with the comment about assignment three. It's just kind of like, we want it to feel like assignment two and that you're kind of like, okay, I can kind of figure out how to approach this, but it just, it's, it's going to be more than a Euclidean vector because we're going to let you use STL everything. So yeah, it can't be, it can't be that. Um, Okay, so some other questions about this. Um, people are asking, can we have the 22 exam? Yeah, I'll give, I'll package all that up for you on Thursday. Um, I, I'm just trying to get it all together at the moment. As I said, what's really hard is that we have to write a sample exam and a final exam. And it's just, we're just trying to get it all together. Um, so I'll give everyone all of that. It'll all come up on the exam page. You can just check back here on Thursday and hope I haven't crossed this out and said Friday that that's, that's a very big possibility. Um, that's okay. We'll get through it. Um, so then there's a great question from Pink Omega, which is, are there uh, auto tests to run for the exam? No. I mean, yes. Sorry, let me... <laughs> yesn't, right? Um, so... What we will do is we will provide you with a command that you can run on the CSE machines that will clone your Git repo and it will try and compile both of your questions. There'll be probably two commands, one for each question. It'll clone your repo and try and compile um, your question and then it will try and run it against one test a really simple test. Like if you think back to assignment one, or I mean, hell, all the assignments, it's like, you think about how in assignment one, we like uh, had one test here. 
that was just like check that we will we will get we will we will run it against this test i mean we'll probably this test will probably just be in your repo but like we will clone it and we will try and compile it on command line and run your test and the reason we do that is because i want you to submit your exam knowing that it compiles and as i said to my 2521 students we give you some really primitive sanity check um so that you know your code isn't effed not so that you know it works you knowing it works is up to you like you're all adults you can figure out and make sure your code works we want to make sure that your code isn't totally ruined um yeah exactly so like like i want your code to compile i want everyone's code to compile i want everyone's code to like not be totally broken um, it just saves everyone hassle. It saves you stress. It saves me stress. It saves me getting more emails in my life, right? So um, that's that's how we're going to approach it. Uh, yeah, that's what we'll do. This will all be part of the sample exam too. I'm going to be honest with you all. I don't think I'm going to get you the sample exam by Thursday. It might be Friday. Um, I'd rather do it right than do it quick, if that makes sense. Particularly because your exam is like so far away like three weeks away um but but check back here i'll add some more stuff here um so that's the gist that's what we want the second question to be like something with a little more breadth that actually gets you familiar with c plus plus the obvious topics that that relates to are like okay and then it's like well what topics are in the co uh, exam well let's have a think let's look through the list okay so what do we got here I can tell you ones that are definitely kind of going to be in the exam. I, let, let's run through these one by one. So, introduction M setup, irrelevant. C++ basics. I mean, all of that's kind of going to be in the exam implicitly because you need to know most of that. Um, you obviously don't need to know the theory because there's no theory in the final exam. Um, great. STL containers, iterators, and algorithms. Uh, again, while none of these are required to be used, I, get, I mean... You do need to know these a little bit because it's likely that, you know, if we ask you to implement a small class, there might be like an iterator component there, for instance, or something like that. Um, class types, all of that's going to be important because, you know, you're going to have to probably implement a constructor somewhere or a static member somewhere. Operator overloading is an obvious yes. Exceptions are an obvious yes. Um, I think the only thing I'd probably say is that exceptions could appear in either or both questions. Um, resource management is a harder one because this one is harder to test explicitly. You probably wouldn't see a ton of this appear in the exam because most of this is implementation details. And for the sake of the exam, we're going to be kind of black box testing everything. So like you could use this if you want, but my gut, my gut feeling is that you'll largely be able to avoid smart pointers for the exam. Um, well, yeah, like you won't be required to do it and you'll probably be able to avoid it. Um, and also, you, you got to test it on this in both assignments, so I'm not too fussed that people don't get it. I don't know why I highlighted resource management and talked about smart pointers, I'm sorry, but I guess that's all tied into the same topic. Um, yep. Uh, resource management, obviously, we will expect you to understand the rule of five and move constructors and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, templates intro. Uh, yeah, so it's it's extremely likely that your second question in the exam is going to be a templated class. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, custom iterators. I'm still on the fence about this one. Um, it's it's a real sinkhole of a topic is my problem. So like I get anxious about putting this on an exam because I feel like it it takes it's a lot of boilerplate and it takes some headspace. Um, I don't know. If it appears on the exam, it's going to be for like the last 3% of the marks just to really help the, the top 10 students separate themselves out from each other. Okay, so if it does appear on the exam, it's something that will... Uh, I, I just, I'm just flagging that like the majority of you would look at that and be like, I don't have time for that. But some students will because they're, they're just higher performers, right? Um, so that one is still like a bit of a maybe... Uh, and then advanced templates, advanced types. This is all that stuff around specializations and um, type traits. That 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 may appear in some strange ways, but um, again, I don't expect that to be something major. I mean, the good thing about this, the, the assignment, the, the exam in this course, and I, I, I've been very privileged or cursed to look after a lot of very practical courses in CSE, is that people always ask me, like, what do I study? And it's like, you've been studying all term, guys. High five, you know, like... 
assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, like you've been literally studying for this exam all term. Obviously, you can do some preparation and refamiliarizing, but it's like if you've done the assignments, you get it. You're ready. You're good. You know? Um, and if you haven't done the assignments, or go do them. It's a good time to start. That'd be, that'd be the number one place I'd recommend everyone studies. If you didn't finish part of assignment, go finish it. Um, Clarissa says, on the spec, will there be mark allocations so that we know information like how custom iterators are for the 95 plus students? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, the exam will be well signposted. Um, most, most exams I write are generally relatively well signposted for marks. I know we've had this ongoing conversation with some students about how they felt assignment three wasn't clear enough about marks. That's not a reflection of my attitude. That's just a reflection of that assignment is just, I didn't write it. We just kept recycling it and we used it again and again and again. And this is the first time people have complained and the complaints make sense. So we're going to change it. Um, so don't get, don't get stressed out by that. Um, just to everyone. So there w it will be very clear on the exam, like particularly with the exam, um, in my view, it's really important that you all get to make informed decisions about where you spend your time, right? Like you need to be able to look at every part of the exam and the majority of you, like in, in any exam, most students usually get nearly everything done and there's always something they didn't quite get to, right? Um, so... It may, we just need to empower you to be able to make those decisions quite quickly, right? You need to be able to look at that and be like, that's that many marks, that's that many marks, that's that many marks, right? Um, yeah, so Dimitri says, assignments connected to exams are very good for students. Yeah, so without getting into the philosophy of it again, I hate open book exams in the sense that uh, I don't think they add any, like, okay, like, what's the benefit of it? Like, I, I, again, I talked about this earlier today to other students is that I would rather just have your three assignments worth more personally. And then you ask, why can't you do that? Because if I got rid of the exam, the uni would ask me like, well, how'd you just get rid of the exam? Surely the exam mattered. And I'd be like, it does because it's the only place we teach dynamic poly. It's the only place we can assess dynamic, pol dynamic, dynamic polymorphism. Um, so then, then we'd have to start putting a bunch of stuff in, in the other assessments and make everything harder. And my general attitude is I'd rather distribute your workload over four assessments than three. So that's why we still have an exam. I'm always trying to get it lower though, every term. So um, it's likely, I'm, I'm starting to get to the point now where particularly for these level six courses, I don't really like exams being more than 25%. So last year, the exam was 50%. The year before that, it was at least 50. This year, it's 30. So... Big drop, big step down from last year. Um, and dynamic... <laughs> dynamic polymorphism is also going to be on the exam. Uh, expect, expect, to be, expect to have to be familiar with just the general idea of inheritance. I don't know what specifics from that topic we'll want to push into the exam. Obviously, we can't push everything. Um, but, you know, we'll do our best. The questions then come up again of, oh, well... Can I self-plagiarize? Uh, I Why not? I don't know. It feels weird to punish students who did good work to not be able to use their good work. You're basically saying like, hey, you who didn't finish the exam, if you're ready, like, you know, I don't really understand it too well. Um, so yeah, if you anything, anything in the tutes, anything in the lecture notes, anything in your assignments, um, not your friend's assignments, just yours, you can use that in the exam. I've seen this before in courses like this. Students will come to the exam with their little mini template with a constructor ready to go, change the names and stuff. If you want to do that, you can. Uh, that's up to you. Um, we're not trying to kill you with boilerplate. You know, it's a time-based exam. I don't mind like assignment two and three where you have to spend some time doing boilerplate because that's just a necessity of life. But the, the idea is not to kill you with boilerplate. And when we write the exam, honestly... Um, if I look at it and I say, God, that's, that's going to spend, they're going to spend 15 minutes just writing out all these prototypes. We'll probably just give you the prototypes, you know. I don't know because I haven't written it, but it's like, that's probably what will happen. Um, if, if like, there's a lot of common sense, again, that's applied to these scenarios. Uh, the only question I can think about that hasn't been asked is what happens if the, what happens if my code doesn't compile? What happens if everything fails? Um That's a good question. Generally speaking, 
It depends on the severity of the situation. CSE is not resourced to review 800 questions between T2 and T3. Um, so like if you have a question, if you have a question that doesn't compile and you know it's like literally a small change made it not compile, then we'll probably look at it, right? Because um, there's only two questions in the exam. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, like if, if you get like a, here's an example. If you get like a six out of 15 in an exam and you think that you're like, oh, it should have worked. Um, it should have worked, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like you can request for us to review your mark, but we're not going to fix anything. We're literally going to look at it. We're going to make sure that the code you submitted was marked correctly. And then that's it. And that's just, that's just a necessity of it. Um, as I say to all students, if your, if your exam mark approaches zero or your a question is zero, usually because it didn't compile or there was a critical runtime error, or you just failed the course if you're in like the 40 to 50 range and your exam mark was terrible, then, then we will look at your exam to see what we can do. Um, I, I, have a, I have students every term who get like a 48 in the course and uh, they, they get like a 12 out of, they get out like a four out of 30 in the exam. And we usually look at their exam to be like, did they get a four out of 30 because they just didn't know enough and they just didn't write enough? Maybe that happens a lot. That happens most of the time. But sometimes students actually, you look at it and you're like, oh, this really looks like they knew what they were doing. It was just some really bad luck, you know? And we don't, we don't want a, a pivotal outcome in your life to span from a, an hour of bad luck. You know what I mean? So um, if you don't know your stuff, you don't know your stuff. We can't, we can't just sugarcoat that. But there are always scenarios where just bad things happen, unlucky things happen, and, and we're always happy to accommodate that. Um, Michael says, if the exam is all auto-marked, is there any reason to write good code rather than just writing it fast? Let me, ans let me answer a different question. First question. If the exam is all auto-marked, does that mean that we're required to write good code? The answer to that is no. Uh, is there a reason to write good code? Usually good code works better. Um, so, you know, all of you probably by now get C++ and get why it's cool and you're probably not going to go and write the exam answers in C because you know how powerful STL containers are because you know how powerful these language features are. Um, so I expect most of you to want to write good-ish C++, but I don't expect you to name variables well or, you know, any of that stuff. Uh, it's, it's, it's a time exam. Um, yeah, and Clarissa says the reason to write good code is that if there are bugs, you can actually read it. That's exactly right. You want to be able to read your own code. Um, but you make the judgment on that. It's up to you. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hmm, C-star loops. Oh, you, you, can, you can bath in C-star loops in the exam if you'd like. Um... Probably, probably the one thing I marked at uni that I'll never forget, that just like stood out to me, it was a 2511 assignment that I marked in, I don't know, 2014 or something. And it was like, I, I, it was in Java and it was literally just for int, I don't know how Java works. I forgot how to write Java. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Can you do four loops in Java? I, I guess so. Um... Anyway, in ja it was basically a student that did this for every letter of the alphabet. It was it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was just it was just every letter of the alphabet indented all the way to Z. They had twenty six nested loops, and the thing that really blew my mind was that it somehow passed most of the auto tests. It was one. It was the entire project was written in the static void main function, and it worked. Genius or moron, I'll never know. Um, Dimitri says, bad connection to VLAB may uh, let me connect, cannot run my code on CSE machines. So here's the thing. If you, have a, if you have a bad connection and you know about this bad connection, what I'm telling you right now is that do whatever you can to solve it. Talk to your family, talk to your friends. Um, you know, 
Okay, let me let me let me answer this again a couple of ways. Talk to your family, talk to your friends, do what you can to fix it. You know, move your move your laptop. It, most like most of the time, most internet issues in homes are usually because of home internet issues, not because of gateway issues. That being said, gateway issues happen sometimes too. One of my closest friends, they have a 4G modem that powers their house and it can be very intermittent. You're just gonna have to see and get comfortable to see how, how good you can make it. If you don't feel like relying on it in the exam, um, then just raise it with me and we can talk about SUPS or something. Um, don't worry about something bad happening. To all of you, something bad happens in the exam. It always happens, it's just an exam. Like, oh, you're, you're, you know, your VS code crashes and you lost the last four minutes of work or like the, the power flicks and your desktop reboots. Like, like these things kind of happen and you should always go into these exams expecting like, you know, five or so minutes of just crap um, happening. Uh, you say VLAB's just bad. I mean, so the thing about VLAB is that, oh, if it's, if, if, if it's, a, if it, if it's a connection, I mean, sorry, I'm answering this question for people broadly who find VLAG, v, v, VLAG. Oh God. Is that not a meme yet? I'm sure someone's memed that already, but if not, please, please credit me for it. Um, no doubt someone's named it. That's just too good. So if you have a problem with VLAB that isn't to do with lag and it's just like it randomly crashes, then I'd probably email SS at CSE and raise the issue with them um, because that sounds like it's a not, not a network bandwidth problem or anything like that. Um, for those of you pining for a break, I'm not convinced this lecture will... We'll talk about whether this lecture will go till 8 or not, because if it doesn't go to 8, we'll just power through another 10 minutes or so. Um, though I did just want to answer a question that I felt was asked before, though I feel like I've lost it in my head now. Oh yes, what I was going to say is that even if you have a bad internet connection, um, we're still going to put our basic auto test uh, in, the, um, in the repo anyway, right? Like, so you're going to be able to run the test yourself, just like how you run tests for your assignment. The, the CSE script, like when I say there's a command on CSE that will check it for you, it will literally just clone your repo and run the build and run all test command. Like it's the same thing you're going to do in, in, in VS Code. It's just, I know from experience, if you don't, if you don't give someone something that's like made by someone else and can be run repeatedly and is very simple, then there's going to be some discrepancy somewhere. So, um, yes. Cool. Any other questions? Um, I'll probably run a revision lecture. Uh, you're all probably tired and there's like 40 people here and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I was thinking about talking about more revision stuff tonight, but then I was like, you're all probably just pooped and I'm probably better off having a random lecture in like two weeks from now or something. Um, but even then, I feel like a lot of you are pretty, like, good. Like, you've done these three assignments. Like, most of you probably get it. I'm not, I'm not trying to de devalue the importance of preparation, but it's just, like, you've, you've been preparing all term. So, in a lot of ways, it's one of the exams that, as long as you maybe do a little bit of C++ programming a few days before and make sure you're not feeling out of touch with it, like, you know, you're okay. And you've got all your assignments there. You've got things to rely on as well. You're not going into a, a cold room blank. Um, you can put on music. You can put on your rave LEDs. Like you can do everything during the exam. Um, okay. Any other questions? I just want to see how how much deeper we're going to go tonight. Uh, Dimitri Chen says, "Can this command, the the command being the the dry run command, uh, just run with SSH connections?" Yes, definitely. Um, it it you could just SSH like there'll be instructions when I release the sample ex oh, I will release instructions to this stuff like you you will you will know what to do you're gonna log into CSE and you're literally gonna open up like you're gonna you're gonna open a terminal and you're gonna go uh, SSH this what in the world. Okay, I don't know what's wrong with that. Um, you know, you're going to. Uh, it's not. It's not CSE. It's my computer. I couldn't connect to AWS earlier today, and now I know it's not. 
the trillion dollar company's fault. <laughs> Um, you're going to open a terminal. I don't like that terminal. You're going to open a terminal and you're just literally going to write something like 6771 exam question one. Um, I don't know whether I need to get your Z number or not. I probably do. So you probably write your Z number and it will just, it'll just do a thing for a couple minutes as it compiles and tests and then it'll just say, well, good. It'll tell you like, did it compile and did, you know, did, did your test pass? So, uh, yeah. Any other questions? How do we submit? You submit the same way that your um, assignments are. We take your master branch. Uh, it's a good question though, and I'll add a note to this, uh, to the, to the spec. I think it's already in the spec, but um, we will take your master branch and typically what we do is we revoke access to your repo at probably like 12, 1201 or uh, 501 PM or something. So as long as you make sure that what you see on GitLab is good, um, then you're sweet. And remember, if you, if you want to know, you check GitLab, you log in, you look at GitLab, you log in here. The things to look for are the, the timestamps mainly, um, you know, so you look at that and, and, you know, if you just pushed and this says like a second ago, you're sweet. What's, what's really important to note, because I understand that there are some postgrads in this course in particular who aren't familiar. I don't know why my headphones are on. I'm not listening to anything. Um, there are some postgrads in this. Oh God, I'm so loud. Oh, I have my noise cancelling on. I think I've been screaming for the last hour. Um, if you have, what are they talking about? Oh yeah, Git. I know there's postgrads in the course who don't, um, aren't very familiar with Git. And what I want you to remember is that the timestamps you see on GitLab are the times of your commits, not the times of your pushes. So if you commit at like um, 4.55 p.m., five minutes before the exam ends, and you push one minute before the end of the exam and you log on to GitLab, it's going to say authored five minutes ago. Um, it's not going to say one minute ago. So just keep that in mind so you don't stress yourself out. That It's the time of the last commit. Pushing is an act of syncing, and that timestamp is just the last commit. So don't worry about that. Um, for some of you, if you haven't done any commits for seven or eight minutes, it's going to say push seven or eight minutes ago. We will revoke your, your GitLab access. So please, um, please make sure it's all pushed by the final time of 5 p.m. Otherwise, we won't let you push after that. Um, yep. Any other questions? Let, if you have any other questions, get them all out now. Because uh, you know, if we have ten questions, we'll just run through them all. But it's hard when we keep coming back to like you know, let's ask another question. So, Cool. Um, we're probably going to have another short lecture anyway, just to say hi and answer any questions people have before the exam, um, which I'll email about sometime. And you'll see the sample exam come out later in the week, uh, probably Friday, um, and we'll have more information there on the final exam. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have much else to say. Remember to fill out my experience for T2. That'd be awesome. Um, and beyond that, just, uh, I guess, just a big thank you to everyone, as always, for a great term. Um, it's always fun to teach this course, and people people seem to enjoy the content, which is always, always motivating. So I'll either see you around, some of you, and some of you are graduating soon, too. So I hope you are... Uh, Hope you have a great life, I guess. Uh, yeah, I am teaching 6080 next term, so yeah. Um, I'll see some of you, no doubt, because I know that uh, those lot, a fair bit of overlap between those two types of students, two types of courses with students. Cool. Okay. Um, conscious that people are tired again. So, any other questions, post on the forum. Um,
and the the exam will be f the the exam will not be unfair or unreasonable you know it's hard for me to comment what's hard and easy but it's like you know like we we we'll, it, it'll make sense i i promise i'm public on youtube saying that so anyway have a great night everyone um stay safe don't get covid uh, congrats again on getting assignment three out. You're 70% through the course. There's not many courses you can say about that at this point in term. Um, and have a good night. I'll see you all later.